First, I want to uh, welcome our two witnesses, and, I'll, and they'll be introduced a little bit later. But uh, once again, uh, apologize to everybody for the inconvenience. Apologize to myself, because nobody likes to be inconvenienced. But it looks like we have a system set up here that we can uh, pursue with our, uh, our hearings. Um, and without objection, uh, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for this panel, which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. Uh, also, uh, I would like to emphasize at this time that uh, this hearing deals with a very complex matter and it's uh, a large am amount of material and therefore written questions I'm sure will be followed up so I ask uh, for as much cooperation as you can give us because there are times when uh, questions are sent in and they sort of get lost but uh, be because there's so much and it's complicated and now our time looks like it's going to be shortened we may have to depend a whole lot on our, on our written questions so uh, we ask for your cooperation uh, there. But uh, I, I will go ahead with an opening statement and offer time for anybody else who wants to have an opening statement. For me? Yeah, I'll, I'll give mine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. But um, I, I, I want to emphasize that uh, these hearings I consider very, very important. It ha it, they've come about because of many things that's happened over the last few years. There's been a lot of uh, movement in the country for more transparency in general, as well as uh, with the Federal Reserve System, and I think my position on this is uh, fairly well uh, known. Uh, but also, there's been uh, legislation passed. Uh, the uh, Dodd-Frank bill has uh, stipulations about uh, more information coming to us uh, uh, by that legislation passed last year. Uh, there's also been the court cases uh, that has required under the Freedom of Information <coughs> Act, and we'll be dealing with a lot of that today, and also the provisions in the law that were, uh, that was language that was put in uh, by uh, basically uh, Senator San Sanders uh, that has required some uh, additional information. But, uh, you know, what is referred to today so often on, on hearings and the materials that came out of the uh, Freedom of Information Act is called the dump. And uh, I find that uh, rather interesting to, to call it that because it sounds like, you know, a lot of material was dumped. And when you think of 29,000 pages of technical information, it, it is very, very large and uh, a lot of people have been studying it. Our staffs have been working very hard and quite frankly, it isn't all that easy to figure out. You know, it reminds me of, of a story that was told, and, and uh, supposedly a true story, that an individual was being um, uh, audited by the Federal Reserve. And they came to him and they said, we want five years of everything that you've ever done and every, every receipt you've ever had. And uh, of course, that made him very unhappy. So he put them all together in a bushel basket, and he dumped them. And I'll tell you what, it didn't go, <laughs> it didn't do it go over very well. And he got into a lot of trouble. I'm not suggesting this is similar, but it's a story that reminds me when I look and try to figure out really what we have. It's a, a lot of material, and to sort this out is, 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 is not, not easy. You know, the, um, the, one, the one argument, and I understand the argument very clearly on the hesitancy of the Federal Reserve not to give out too much information too early, uh, with the idea that it might be proprietary, it might set the stage for concerns in the market. But, you know, I think of this in contrast to what the purpose of the SEC is. The SEC has a purpose to investigate, demand reports, and get the information out immediately, and that's their responsibility. And if, and if a company doesn't let us know exactly what they're doing and, and what their accounting procedures are, they get into a lot of difficulty. But the argument seems to be different for the Federal Reserve that, oh, if we have information about a, a bank that might be, you know, in difficulty, you know, in a market situation, that information should be available to us. So I, I take the position that information shouldn't be that, uh, that detrimental to us. 
and uh, the, the more we can get, the better. And uh, I am hopeful that uh, today we will be able to ask some pertinent questions to get more information, that members can follow up with uh, more questions later on, and that uh, there will be more transparency without ever injuring anybody. That certainly would be my goal. So I would like now to uh, uh, yield five minutes to Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you so much for holding this hearing to examine uh, information disclosed by the Federal Reserve in compliance with the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act uh, and the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, also, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing today. Uh, due to the U.S. financial crisis, the, the Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. Uh, this legislation was crafted as a response to the financial crisis, which has cost nearly 10 million American jobs and over $10 trillion in household wealth. Uh, nearly 4 million families have lost their homes to foreclosure and an additional 4.5 million have slipped into the foreclosure process or are seriously behind on their mortgage payment. According to the Financial Crisis Inquiry re report, a combination of excessive borrowing, risky investments, and the lack of transparency put the financial system on a collision course of self-destruction. In the years leading up to the crisis, too many financial institutions as well as too many households borrowed too much, leaving them vulnerable to financial distress if the value of the investments declined even modestly. For example, as of 2007, the five major investment banks were operating with extraordinarily thin capital. By one measure, their leverage ratios were as high as 40 to 1, meaning for every $40 in assets, there was only $1 in capital to cover losses. Less than a 3% drop in asset value could wipe out a company. Leverage was often hidden in off-balance sheet entities and derivatives positions and through window dressing of financial reports available to the investing public. Within the financial system, the danger of this debt was increased because transparency was not required or desired. Undercover corporate dealings assisted in the financial meltdown which still plagues us today. In order for democracy and capitalism to exist correctly, transparency must be at the core and trust and transparency and the rule of law are fundamental to this nation's success. And business depends in some way on trust. A trusted business produces good products and a trusted business will deliver good services. Democracy depends in some way on trust. Transparency promotes government accountability, free and fair elections, Competition in free markets and the rule of law are critical to it. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act addresses these issues by reforming the Federal Reserve. One, it limits the Federal Reserve's 13-3 emergency lending authority by prohibiting emergency lending to an individual entity. The Secretary of Treasury must approve any lending program and the program must be broad-based and loans cannot be made to insolvent firms. Collateral must be sufficient to protect taxpayers from losses. And two, it requires the Federal Reserve to disclose counterparties and information about amounts, terms, and conditions of 13-3 and discount window lending and open market transactions on an ongoing basis with specified time delays. And these are just a few examples of the importance of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the wit witnesses' comments. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Lukemeyer, do you care for an opening statement? 
Okay. No more opening statements, so we'll go on and uh, introduce our witnesses. Uh, first, we have Mr. Scott Alvarez as general counsel at the Board of Governors, a post he has held since 2004. He has been with the board for 30 years. And also, Mr. Thomas Baxter, Jr., has been general counsel and executive vice president of the legal group at the Federal Reserve Bank at, of New York since 1995. He also serves as deputy general counsel of the FOMC. Mr. Baxter has been with the New York Fed uh, for, for more than uh, 30 years. With, without objection, uh, your written statements will be made a part of the record. It has been agreed upon by the witnesses, ranking member Clay and myself, that Mr. Alvarez will deliver the oral remarks for the joint written testimony of Mr. Alvarez and, and Mr. Baxter. This testimony may run longer than the customary uh, five minutes. And I, I yield now to Mr. Alvarez. Chairman Paul, ranking member Clay, members of the subcommittee, Thomas Baxter, the General Counsel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the ways the Federal Reserve informs the Congress and the American people about its policies and actions. Central bank lending facilitates the implementation of monetary policy and allows the central bank to address short-term liquidity pressures in the banking system. This role of lender of last resort is a critical one, long filled by central banks around the world, especially during times of economic crisis, when discount window lending can mitigate strains in financial markets that could otherwise escalate and lead to sharp declines in output and employment. In the United States, all discount window loans are fully secured, and the Federal Reserve has not suffered a loss to date on its discount window lending. The Federal Reserve regularly releases significant detailed information about its operations in order to promote the understanding of how the Federal Reserve fosters financial stability and economic stability, and to facilitate an evaluation of our actions while preserving the ability to effectively fulfill the responsibilities that Congress has given the Federal Reserve. Since 1914, the Federal Reserve has published its balance sheet every week. We also publish full financial statements annually that are audited by an independent public accounting firm which for the last four years has been Deloitte and Touche. These audits cover Maiden Lane, Maiden Lane 2, and Maiden Lane 3, as well as the transactions conducted through the discount window and with foreign central banks. The Federal Reserve also publishes a special monthly report to Congress posted on our website that details the Federal Reserve's emergency lending programs, including providing information on the amount of lending under each program, the type and level of collateral associated with those loans, and information about the borrowers under those facilities. In addition, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York maintains a website that includes schedules of purchases and sales of securities as part of open market operations, with QCIP information describing the securities involved. The Federal Reserve is fully cooperating with the GAO in an extensive review of each of the special lending facilities developed during the crisis. This review will assess operational integrity, internal controls, security and collateral policies, policies governing third-party contractors, and the existence of any conflicts of interest or inappropriate favoritism in the establishment or operation of the facilities. As provided by the Dodd-Frank Act on December 1, 2010, the board published detailed information on its website about the Federal Reserve's actions during the financial crisis. This release includes the names of borrowers, the amount borrowed, the date credit was extended, the interest rate charged, information about collateral, and a description of the credit terms under each facility. Similar information was provided for the draws of foreign central banks on their dollar liquidity swap lines with the Federal Reserve. For agency MBS transactions, details included the name of the counterparty, the security purchased or sold, and the date, amount, and price of the transaction. On March 31, 2011, the Federal Reserve released documents related to the discount window in response to requests filed under the Freedom of Information Act. The March 31 release included documents containing information related to borrowers at the discount window between August 8, 2007 and March 1, 2010 that was not required to be disclosed under the Dodd-Frank Act. <coughs> Going forward, the Dodd-Frank Act provides for the release of information 
on any broad-based emergency lending facility one year after the termination of the facility, as well as a GAO audit of the facility. The Act also provides for the release of information regarding discount window lending and open market operations conducted after July 21, 2010, with a two-year lag. For lending facilities, including both emergency lending facilities and the discount window, and for open market operations, the Federal Reserve will publish information disclosing the identity of the borrower or counterparty, transaction amount, interest rate or discount paid, and the collateral pledge. The Federal Reserve believes the lags provided by the Dodd-Frank Act for the release of transaction level information establish an important balance between the public's interest in information about participants in transactions with the Federal Reserve and the need to ensure that the system can effectively use its congressionally authorized power to maintain the stability of the financial system and implement monetary policy. We will carefully monitor developments in the use of the discount window and other Federal Reserve facilities and keep the Congress informed about their effectiveness. The Federal Reserve has worked and will continue to work with the Congress to ensure that our operations promote the highest standards of accountability, stewardship, and policy effectiveness consistent with meeting our statutory responsibilities. We appreciate the opportunity to describe the Federal Reserve's efforts on this important subject and are happy to answer any questions you may have, and we will be responsive to any written questions you may submit as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman. I will uh, yield myself five minutes, but announce that uh, we will likely be able to have uh, repeat questioning. I, I think the time will permit that, but uh, I will start off with the five minutes. I first want to ask unanimous consent to ad, uh, ad, admit an uh, article for the record from Bloomberg called Fed Gave Banks Prices Gains on $80 Billion Secretive Loans Without Objection. I want to uh, refer to one document, and uh, this little document from the material that we got uh, from the Federal Reserve, it's called a chart pack of market monitoring metrics for Fed facilities. And uh, I'm sure you know all 29,000 pages, and you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. But it, it tells you about the problem that we have in trying to find out information. And this particular document has uh, three, 327 uh, pages to it. But in, in this particular document, it had some interesting material that uh, I did not know about, and I want to ask about it. And it, it reveals that there was a previously undisclosed federal uh, Fed lending program known as the Single Tranche Open Market Operations, and it's referred to as STOMO. And um, this, this is something new, and it, it, it allows to give 0.01%, that is free money, to companies like Goldman Sachs, and was essentially a free loan to these uh, well-connected uh, businesses. But uh, also, the problem that we had in analyzing this to find out information that we're looking for is, it turns out that just in this particular area, 81% of the contents has been redacted. So. We, we end up with a lot of pages, and then we end up with 19% uh, actually has information that we have to uh, uh, sort out. The question is, is wh why were these details, you know, not mentioned? Is it, uh, is it that everything has to be done in secret? Uh, you, you know, we'd like to know, the people would like to know, uh, but we, we didn't see any evidence until this was dug out of here, and uh, maybe it was mistakenly not redacted or something like that. It makes us wonder uh, why we don't know about this. And that, of course, is one of my big beefs with the uh, Federal Reserve is that uh, you, the, the, uh, the central bank wields so much power, so much financial power, you literally can uh, have transactions greater than what we can do with our own budget. And, and that's why it's a deep concern to me, but to many other people as well. But, but uh, why was this not published? And, uh, and are these and other programs that have yet to be disclosed, are there others? Uh, why were so many pages redacted? Can you really claim this to be in compliance with FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, uh, when, when we don't know what's been excluded? And uh, I, I would like to get, get your reaction from this. And uh, uh, 
talk specifically about this one program and uh, what's been going on with it. So, Mr. Chairman, the program you refer to, the um, uh, single tranche OMO program, was not a secret program. It was actually publicly announced by the Federal Reserve on March 7, 2008, when the program began. Uh, it was a short-term program that ended in uh, January of 2009, and transactions that were conducted of, under that program as part of our open market operations were reported, along with other open market operations, on the New York uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank website uh, in, uh, uh, very quickly after the transactions occurred. Um, the documents you have before you uh, are from the response for the Freedom of Information Act request. And so that, may ex that itself should explain why there are redactions. The way the Freedom of Information Act works, it is a request for certain types of information in documents. So uh, redactions are made. First, the agency collects all documents that may have any information that relates to the request. Then information that is not requested is taken out of the documents, redacted from the documents, simply because it's not responsive to the request. So it's not a desire to keep things secret. It's instead a desire to be responsive to the request. There are often, when, you, uh, when uh, a requester asks for documents, there often is information that is extraneous or not the kind of information that was requested, not relevant to the request, and that's taken out of the documentation. And that's why you see so much uh, redaction in the documents uh, before you. Uh, these, these documents were reviewed by the court. Uh, and released by the court in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. Does, th does that mean if somebody would follow up and broaden that request, that all that material could become available? Would they have to just change the Freedom of Information Act so, request? So if, the re if another request were made for a broader range of information, we would review that information, determine what is confidential and what could be released, and a decision then would be made on, the on that request. Can it be made so broad that just re just turn over everything? Uh, I, I'm not sure there are enough people in the world to uh, look at everything we have to turn over everything, um, but we would uh, do the best we could. Okay. My five minutes is up, and I now yield to Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alvarez. Uh, just one question. Has the uh, dramatic and, I believe, welcome increase in transparency uh, including your own initiatives and those called for in the Wall Street Reform Act of 2010, had any adverse or troubling uh, consequences either for policy making at the Fed or for the financial institutions that you regulate and interact with? So we think the increases in transparency, particularly around monetary policy that we've taken in the last few years, have been very helpful and responsive. Uh, and have improved the understanding of the Federal Reserve and, and the actions, policy actions we're trying to take. Um, the, uh, we've provided a lot of detailed information about uh, credit transactions we engaged in during the crisis. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, Congress, we think, struck a very important balance between the need for access to that information and providing a delay so that uh, participants in the transaction don't uh, experience stigma that often occurs when there's an immediate release of information, allowing therefore an explanation for why uh, institutions have participated in the, uh, in the facilities. Uh, we're monitoring whether there'll be any, uh, any effect. We of course won't know until we see how these facilities operate in the future. We will, current, we will keep the Congress informed on the effectiveness. If there is any bad, bad effect, we'll let you know. So uh, you will inform the Congress as to if, if there needs to be changes in, the, in this law or, or whatever. Okay, thank you for thank your you. response. And at this time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to the gentlewoman. I thank the uh, gentleman for yielding, and I and I thank uh, I thank the chairman uh, for holding this important hearing, and I welcome both of our witnesses. Uh, and uh, I think we all have to remember that uh, we were really on the verge of collapse. Uh, that uh, this was a uh, uh, we had the Great Recession instead of the Great Depression because of the monetary policy in many of the steps that we took. Uh, one of those steps that we've taken to stabilize our markets and move forward is the Dodd-Frank bill, 
And in that, we required the GAO to conduct an audit of the Federal Reserve. And we also required the Fed to make information about the transactions uh, through emergency lending facilities from December 2008 to March 2010 available to the public. In addition, Dodd-Frank required that the Fed disclose information about the entities that used the discount window or under, I believe it was Section 13.3 lending facilities. Um, but in addition to what we required in Dodd-Frank, the Federal Reserve is also already subject uh, to robust congressional oversight. And I'd like to ask our two witnesses, can you give the committee some examples of the types of congressional oversight that you are already required to do, even before Dodd-Frank? The two of the most Im uh, important uh, types of oversight are um, uh, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, the chairman of the FOMC, uh, provides testimony on the economy uh, twice each year uh, on the call of the House and, and the Senate. Uh, and that is an important check on our monetary policy and the state of the economy. Uh, another uh, uh, important uh, uh, method is this hearing and hearings like this that we're, we're going through. The staff and the governors and the chairman of the Federal Reserve, the presidents of the Reserve Bank, have often been uh, called to, to Congress to report on every aspect of our duties and how we uh, implement various policies. And we use, uh, you use those as oversight to us, and we explain the positions that we've taken. So I think it's the interaction between uh, the uh, Congress and, and the Federal Reserve in testimonies in particular that uh, have been an effective form of oversight. OK, um, my time is about to expire. But as you know, there's a GAO audit re authority now. Was there anything that is excluded from the GAO audit authority? So the GAO is, not, is authorized to uh, audit a full range of the Federal Reserve's responsibilities. Uh, the, uh, that includes all of the emergency transactions, the discount window, uh, our, transaction, uh, our supervisory authority, uh, our, our, our consumer authority, all the various aspects of authority. The, uh, an area that, is, uh, that Congress has reserved to the Federal Reserve is the implementation of monetary policy, the policy the actual policy-making decision process. The uh, GAO does look at how we implement the policy in the form of making sure the transactions actually occur as, as a, appropriate, um, that they're accounted for properly on the balance sheet, uh, that um, uh, they're fully disclosed. But the decision-making process for monetary policy is, is the one thing outside the GAO's scope of authority. Mr. Chairman, may I? May I follow up with one brief question on, on, the, on why that, why, what are the arguments for, for excluding it? Why was that excluded? What is the arguments for it? Mr. Alvarez? So the, um, the importance of allowing uh, the Federal Reserve and the FOMC to conduct monetary policy independently is, uh, uh, has been demonstrated throughout the world in, a, in both actions by other central banks and in a variety of studies of uh, monetary policy. The, um, the uh, point, I think, is that um, the, the, the Congress wanted to reserve to the FOMC the ability to have discussions that are full and free and frank and to explore all the possible alternatives for monetary policy to reach the best monetary policy decision. Moreover, if GAO, GAO doesn't do audits in the sense of a technical audit like a, a um, uh, a financial auditor might do, but also but does uh, performance reviews and policy reviews. So uh, that would mean that the GAO would review the alternatives considered for monetary policy, how the decisions were made, whether the decisions were actually uh, appropriate. But that would cause second guessing of the FOMC, cast into doubt whether the FOMC was actually making the policy decision or whether the GAO was making policy decisions in monetary policy and make it more difficult for the monetary policy to be done effectively by the Federal Reserve. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the Vice Chairman, Mr. Jones from North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate uh, you holding these hearings, as others have said. And you know, I'm going to take a little different approach. I represent uh, the 3rd District of Eastern North Carolina. 
Uh, it's a great district to represent, the home of Camp Lejeune Marine Base, uh, Cherry Point Green Air Station, the Outer Banks. And the frustration of the average business person down in my district is very deep and severe. And we have had numerous inquiries from the 3rd District, the citizens of the 3rd District, about the Federal Reserve and how decisions are made. And I know you cannot go into some of the uh, backroom negotiations at the Reserve. I'm not even asking that. But how do you say to the um, small business owner uh, that, you know, in this crisis situation, we seem to find ways to help foreign banks, uh, foreign entities. Uh, and I'm looking here at the note that my staff prepared for me that uh, Harley Davidson, McDonald's, GE, Verizon, Toyota. And yet, I've got people in my district saying that I go to the local banks and I can't get any loans and my credit has always been good. Why and how does the Federal Reserve seem to be able to find the way to help these entities that are gigantic and through greed and, and, and manipulation uh, they cheated and yet they get bailed out they get the help when the average business person down in eastern North Carolina and probably across America uh, they can't even go to a bank they've been banking with for 15 or 20 years and get a loan. And yet, here we are at the Federal Reserve looking at those foreign banks who might need some help or these corporations that might need some help. It's, it's, it really is. That's why this hearing is very important. Uh, the transparency, the trust, and that's a big word to me, trust is just not there with the average citizen when it comes to the Federal Reserve. And yet, if it had not been for the push by, I won't name all the entities that pushed to tell you to show the bottom line, to show what was in the closet of decisions, who was being helped, we never would have known it. And yet, I know you gentlemen are attorneys, and you're probably not at the position where the person ought to be here that ought to be put hand on a Bible to tell the truth to the American people. That's my concern is, how do we build the confidence of the American people when we see what has happened at the Federal Reserve? So, Congressman, I, I, we understand that and, and feel that same frustration. The, um, the programs that were designed and implemented by the Federal Reserve during the financial crisis were not designed to uh, aid big companies for the sake of aiding big companies. The programs that we designed, for example, the TALF program that we designed, um, was designed to, to pass money and, and credit and liquidity onto the American people. So for example, the TALF resulted in three million more auto loans during the crisis than would have occurred, a million more student loans, almost a million small business loans, uh, the, the programs you're talking about uh, that uh, aided Harley-Davidson and uh, Toyota and other companies were the commercial paper facility, which provided short-term funding to those companies so they could continue to keep employment up and manufacturing up in the United States so that they could continue to provide jobs and provide um, opportunities in the United States. It was uh, Our efforts were all designed to try to um, keep the economy moving in order to help uh, individuals and, uh, and small businesses, not for the sake of helping uh, the larger institutions. And I understand that uh, there's a different perception. Uh, part of that di perception, I think, comes from the fact that most of the uh, financial tools that we're given are designed to work through banks or work through large markets. And it's working through, so we use the tools the best we can in order to have the funding uh, aid the broadest range of people possible. Well, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I know my time's about up, but I, I, I guess in a way that if it had not been for these Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal and all these raising the questions, doing the investigation, I don't know if we'd be having this hearing today. I don't know. I thank the gentleman. I, I, you have five minutes to Ms. Maloney from New York. 
I, I thank uh, the chairman for yielding, and as he is well aware, on Friday the jobs numbers come out, and the economy has been improving, not as fast as we would all like, but we are digging our way out of that hole. And now that we have the benefit of hindsight, and we are slowly recovering from the financial crisis of 2008, I know that some um, have taken the position, a position that I do not agree with, but they've taken the position that the Fed's lending uh, during this time actually helped contribute to the crisis. And some have argued that the Fed didn't need to take the actions that it took because the situation would have stabilized on its own. But I'd like to, to ask uh, our, our panelists today, isn't it true that without the actions that the Fed took, that by not uh, setting up the facilities it did, uh, by not giving in institutions access to the discount window to provide additional liquidity to our economy, that the crisis would have been uh, far worse? So your comments, uh, please, Mr. Alvarez and Mr. Haster, Baxter. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we do believe that the facilities that we uh, established, that the Federal Reserve established, uh, did uh, ease the crisis, and um, uh, they certainly were designed to do that. The studies that are beginning to come forward now are starting to show that they actually uh, were successful in um, uh, unfreezing various markets, the commercial paper market, the asset-backed securities market. Uh, providing liquidity to uh, the financial system that was important for the financial system to continue to operate. Uh, the funding that we provided was, was provided without any losses to the taxpayer. Um, indeed, the uh, emergency lending facilities resulted in $9 billion worth of um, uh, interest and fees that were passed on to the Treasury. Um, as, I, as I was explaining to Congressman Jones, the, the facilities were designed in a uh, to provide real uh, uh, relief uh, to, uh, to American consumers and small businesses in the form of student loans, in the form of uh, auto loans, uh, small business loans, uh, credit card loans, um, as well as uh, allowing the uh, operation of companies that relied on the commercial paper market, which had frozen up to continue to uh, find a source of funding to keep their operations going. So we think that the facilities were successful uh, and were a good use of the taxpayer funds. I, I, I would say that there is an impression, and I hear it, I think other members of Congress hear it, that's out there, that, that all of the actions the Fed took during the crisis uh, served uh, only uh, to help financial institutions. Uh, but I, I want to make uh, clear the, the point that, uh, and I want to make sure that people understand that all of these actions were in the form of loans, and, and, and in fact over $125 billion has been returned uh, to the Treasury over and above what was loaned out. That's what I read. I want to know if that's true. Is that true? So we have in the last two years uh, provided uh, about $127 billion in uh, earnings to the Treasury. Yes, that's correct. But can you bring this down to Main Street? Can you give uh, the committee members and, and the, the general um, public some examples of how that uh, lending helped uh, not only stabilize the economy and keep our financial institutions in place, but literally helped Main Street and working men and women? Uh, so I'd, I'd like to return to the uh, TALF program, which was one specifically designed to make sure that loans were made in the United States to help, uh, to help students obtain uh, education loans for college, to help small businesses have uh, SBA loans, credit card loans, uh, to provide auto lending, uh, to provide equipment leasing, uh, and a variety of other kinds of, uh, of loans that were not being made during the financial crisis because of uh, liquidity shortages. Uh, that program was extraordinarily successful. Uh, it is it still operating? It is. Um, it has closed, but the, there are still about $14 billion in loans outstanding. There were $70 billion of credits extended through uh, the program through its life. Much of it is being repaid, has been repaid. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask about a number of programs that the Fed en engages in, including uh, holding gold for foreign company, for countries. 
account services, liquidity programs. In your experience, are these common activities for central banks? Uh, yes, Congresswoman, they are common for central banks. It is common for central banks around the world to hold reserves. And as you know, the, the dollar is the principal reserve currency. At the Federal Reserve in New York, we hold over $3 trillion on behalf of foreign central banks and countries. It is very important to hold those sizable reserves because those sizable reserves are principally invested in Treasury securities, which helps to finance the debt of the United States. So, so holding dollar reserves is a very important function of the Federal Reserve, and, uh, and we do that at the New York Fed. And it is similar to functions that other foreign central banks perform around the world. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I yield five minutes to Mr. Green from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for appearing as well. And uh, <clears throat> I'm interested in the um, central banks of other countries um, as compared to our country and this disclosure that they engage in compared to our country. And I know that the systems are not going to be the same, but uh, with reference to disclosure, can you give some indication so that we can have some sort of comparison. So uh, the, the practices of disclosure vary quite a bit across the world, uh, but I believe the, the Federal Reserve is uh, one of the, if not the most transparent central banks. Many central banks in, in uh, developed countries do not, for example, announce their uh, policy decision or the votes that are taken. The Federal Reserve does both of those. They do not announce uh, or provide minutes for their meetings. The Federal Reserve does provide minutes three weeks after each meeting. Um, many foreign central banks do not publish at all the, the uh, transcripts of their meetings, and the Federal Reserve publishes the transcript uh, five years after each meeting. Um, on the discount window uh, lending, uh, that is a common feature, a common power that, each, uh, that foreign central banks have, but they are much less transparent in that area as well. Um, indeed, uh, you may recall that in, uh, uh, at the start of the crisis, uh, it was a leak about a discount window loan made by the Bank of England to Northern Rock that, re that uh, resulted in a run on uh, Northern Rock there. So uh, the foreign countries tend to be more uh, uh, circumspect about the information they disclose about their discount window uh, lending operation. Yes, sir. With respect to the, the incident that Mr. Alvarez described, the British Parliament has written a report which is titled The Run on the Rock, and it has a section that describes how that run began, and that was um, triggered by public reports about a borrowing by Northern Rock at the Bank of England. And with the permission of the chair, we could submit that report for the benefit of the subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, one additional question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. I know that you've probably gone through this, but explain to um, those who are viewing why it's important to have disclosure and why you tried to achieve this balance that you, 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 you have with reference to disclosure. Uh, for example, it, why not just have a CPA come in or someone come in and just audit everything all the time, every day? Uh, what, what is the downside? So we do have um, a CPA come in, uh, Deloitte and Touche currently, to do an audit of our financial statements, including all of our transactions, our discount window lending, and our open market uh, transactions. Um, the, uh, the thought on disclosure is that disclosing the names of borrowers and the amount they've borrowed uh, provides the American people with more information to uh, um, make sure that the Federal Reserve is acting in a responsible way in uh, its lending facilities. The balance on the other side is that uh, the discount window is a very important tool for uh, both in good times and in bad times. In good times for um, providing uh, short-term liquidity to institutions uh, uh, when they, they need it and also as a monetary policy tool to help uh, reduce the volatility of interest rates. And in emergency times, 
to provide liquidity when it's uh, to institutions that are generally healthy, but where uh, panic has caused asset values to be um, uh, 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 out of whack, as it were, so that they uh, can't fund the, the institution can't fund itself in uh, in an appropriate way. So the discount window is a very important tool. Uh, the concern is that uh, because it's often used by both healthy and troubled institutions, the public will be confused if it sees the names of a borrower at the discount window and not be certain if that institution is healthy or not. Uh, and if a healthy institution is wrongly thought to be troubled because it's accessed the discount window, then uh, that could cause problems for that institution. That causes institutions to back away from using the discount window. Uh, and that makes it a much less effective tool, both in good times and in bad times, for addressing liquidity crisis. So it's important to have a balance in the disclosure. That's why we think the lag time, uh, the two-year period between the uh, actual loan and the announcement of the uh, borrower, is important. That leaves the institution some period of time to explain itself, to demonstrate its health, and to not be tied to uh, troubled uh, transaction at a trouble at a difficult time. Uh, I think my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Thank you. I would like to direct this question to Mr. Uh, Baxter, and I want to follow up on Mr. Jones's question about you know how some of these decisions are made and how sometimes the big guys seem to benefit and the little people lose their mortgages and lose their homes and they lose their jobs and and quite frankly it's very difficult uh, times in this country because. It seems like uh, uh, there were, people are too little to save. There's too, people are too big to, you know, uh, to forget about them. Uh, too big to let them fail. But uh, I want to direct the question about the, the foreign, the, the foreign loans. And it seems to me, from the figures I look at, that nearly one third of all the loans during this period of time were, went to uh, foreign banks. And at one time, at the peak of this, 88 percent of these overall discount window loans went to foreign banks and then uh, but but at the New York Fed I think practically essentially a hundred percent of the loans were going to foreign banks and and uh, the the answer I get is that you know they're, they're foreign banks but they have subsidiaries and and they qualify under under the under the rules I wouldn't say the law but under the rules that they could they, they can uh, you, you know go to the discount when it but it just seems to be way out of out of proportion when you think of that uh, tremendous amount of loaning that went to, to these foreign banks. Uh, uh, and, and this is not easy for the average American citizen to, to understand. Could, could you enlighten us on why it seems to be disproportionate? I'm sure they don't represent that percentage of uh, the financial problems that existed. They weren't you know, well, a third of the problems didn't deal with foreign banks, surely. But what, what is the explanation for that? Yes, Chairman Paul, thank you for that question. First, the starting point is federal statutory law in Section 13, Paragraph 14 of the Federal Reserve Act says to the Federal Reserve that with respect to discount window borrowing, we are to treat the branch or the agency of, of a foreign bank just like we treat our own U.S. chartered depository institutions. So there's this principle of national treatment that we start with, and it's a principle that is embedded in the Federal Reserve Act itself. And so we must treat the branch and agency of a foreign bank in the same manner we treat our own. So that's the starting point. Second is New York is the money center of the United States. And with respect to foreign banks that intend to come to our country and invest in our people, and form branches and agencies in the United States, many of those foreign banking organizations look to, f to form those organizations in the money center, which is in New York. So, so the, the, the short answer to your question, Chairman Paul, is the law requires us to lend to branches and agencies. And with respect to New York in particular, that tends to be the place where foreign banking organizations enter our country. Okay. Fortunately, it still seems to be out of whack. But when when this system invite foreign banks, you know, they're making most of their money overseas. Well, just open up a subsidiary in, in in New York, and therefore they get the line of credit and the protection of the bank, and it's sort of almost like free insurance for them. And uh, 
do you think this is a good idea that a foreign bank all they have to do is open up and get these bailouts? I mean, it it just doesn't seem fair <laughs> at all. Well, the, these these were loans, Chairman Paul. They weren't they weren't gifts in any way, and the foreign banks have to repay just like everyone else, principal and interest. Second, if a foreign bank and some do decide that they would prefer not to form a branch or an agency, but to start a subsidiary bank in the United States. That is their option, and some foreign banks do just that. And of course, the subsidiary bank, which would have a US charter, that has access to the discount window as well. So I'd add one more thing. There is a limit on the amount that they can borrow. They're, they're limited by the amount of a, a collateral that they have that they can post at the discount window. So that's dollar collateral in the United States. Uh, that uh, doesn't allow the foreign central bank to, I mean, the foreign bank to borrow to the full extent of its assets worldwide. It borrows in order to support its dollar activities. Uh, and those dollar activities are largely, uh, though not exclusively, you have a point there, but largely in the United States. Could the argument be made that uh, maybe uh, the banks in Greece should have had a lot more subsidiaries in New York and uh, maybe then uh, Greece wouldn't be in so much trouble. The Fed would have bailed them out too. No, they're, they're, they're still, their assets are in Greece and they're Greek ass assets and they would go to the Greek central bank to uh, borrow there, not, not to the United States. Okay, uh, Mr. Green, do you care for another uh, series? Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Jones, you for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you again. I, um, <clears throat> you know, looking through a lot of these uh, reports and I want to go to Libya and uh, see if you can help me understand the rationale by the Treasury and, and the Reserve. Um, I'll just read one paragraph. Arab Banking Corporation, the lender, part owned by the Central Bank of Libya, using New York branch to get 73 loans from the U.S. Federal Reserve in the 18 months after Lehman Brothers Holdings uh, collapse. Help me understand so that I can explain to people back in my district that here we are, an undeclared war. I mean, any time, and thank God we haven't lost any American military at this point, but we certainly have fired a bunch of missiles. And uh, we're spending millions and millions of dollars, probably billions by now. Uh, and we're helping other countries. How, what, do you, what is the protection if, if uh, Libya is Gaddafi and Gaddafi is Libya or uh, at least it has been for a period of time uh, and we have made these loans to their affiliate or to Libya uh, banks uh, their relationships what, what happens in a wartime situation where we're trying to drive Gaddafi out of business and we have made these loans to him or to Libya. How do you explain that to that person that each and every one of us, both sides of the political aisle, have talked about today that can't get the loans? Where, where does, where, how do you explain this to Walter Jones, who happens to be a member of Congress, so he can explain it to his people back home? So Arab Banking Corporation is a bank that is located in Bahrain. It's not located in Libya. Um, it was, at the time that it borrowed from the Federal Reserve, um, it was not, uh, it, uh, the, the Libyans bought a substantial part of that bank after all the loans that uh, were extended by the Federal Reserve were repaid. So the, we work with the Treasury Department and the State Department um, which uh, the Treasury and State Department have responsibility for identifying banks that, uh, that the United States should not deal with because of, uh, for foreign policy reasons. The responsibility for designating those banks rests with Treasury and the State Department. Uh, we consult with them to make sure that we don't lend to institutions that they have determined we should not be lending to. At the time that our, our credits were extended, Arab Banking Corporation was not identified by Treasury or State Department as a bank that, we, that uh, was of concern. It was uh, a, a, foreign, a foreign bank that had an operation in the United States. 
that was well rated in, in all other respects like another foreign bank from uh, a foreign country. Mr. Chairman, I tell you, uh, knowing that you uh, for many years have picked up more and more support for your bill, uh, legislation to audit the Federal Reserve, I, I mean, I, I wish truthfully, and it has nothing to do with you gentlemen here today, but I'm telling you that the distrust out here by the American people is as deep and severe as I've ever seen. And it does, not only Congress itself, not only the administration, but the Federal Reserve is just at this point at a very low ebb as it relates to trust. And I, I, I'm not talking about you personally. You two men of high integrity, I know that. But uh, right now, the Federal Reserve is not held in, in high esteem by many people in this country. I'll yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I have a few short questions, and then we'll uh, finish up. One thing is, on a follow-up on what Mr. Jones says, is, is the uh, confidence is, is very low. But when you speak of uh, independence, and I understand your terms, and uh, I, I disagree with, with the need for that, but I understand it. But what people hear when you say independence, they hear secrecy. You know, you're, you're going to keep it from us. And, uh, and like the point I made at the beginning, the SEC is to pressure companies to reveal information where the Federal Reserve does the opposite. They want, no, we can't tell anything because it might disturb the markets. I do have one question. During the crisis or any time that you're aware of, uh, has the Federal Reserve or Treasury participated in any gold swaps arrangements? Uh, we don't, the Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Um, so we have not engaged in any gold swaps. But it appears on your balance sheet that you hold gold. What appears on our balance sheet is gold certificates. When we turned in, in uh, before 1934, we did, the Federal Reserve did own gold. We turned that over by, um, by law to the Treasury and received in uh, return for that gold certificate. If, if the Treasury entered into, because under the Exchange Stabilization Fund, I would assume they probably have the, the legal authority to do it, they wouldn't be able to do it then because you have the securities for essentially all the gold? No, we have no the interest in the gold that uh, is owned by the Treasury. We have simply an accounting document that is called gold certificates that represents the value uh, at a statutory rate and, and still that we gave to the Treasury in 1930. And still measured at $42 an ounce, which makes no That's sense right. whatsoever. But, you know, the conventional wisdom today uh, says that uh, gold is really not money. We don't want it to be money. I mean, if you're for the gold standard, there's something wrong with you. And, and uh, yet we hold the gold. And, you know, there have been suggestions made, and, and I've sort of... Uh, you know, encourage the suggestion. You know, if gold is not money and it's an asset and you don't even use it because it's on your balance sheets and you don't even use it at the real value, why, what would, would you have a position on this? Why shouldn't the Treasury just sell the gold, give it back to the people? The people had it at one time, let the people have it. Would you have any objection to that? Would you, would you advise us and say, no, that's, that's not good, we ought to hold the gold? Uh, do you think holding the gold is a good idea or a bad idea? So oh, I have no position on that at all. That's clearly no a position. For the treasury. <laughs> it's a matter for the Treasury. It's not within the purview of, uh, of the yeah, Mr. Baxter, would you have an opinion? I, my opinion is I agree with Mr. Alvarez. No, no, no position. Well, it, it's amazing because I've asked, question, I've asked questions to the Federal Reserve, you, you know, the members of the board for, for years, and uh, whether it's been Mr. Greenspan, I, I can't recall exactly what I've asked Mr. Bernanke, but it's always, well, no, we have to hold on to these assets. But if, if it's not money and we don't need it, we're not going on a gold standard, I mean, I would think that they shouldn't be holding it. The reason I ask that is the truth is, is gold is money, and people don't throw it away, and people do cling to it. And, but I would be, really, there's a lot of people who suspect, because of this lack of transparency, that there's been a tremendous amount of gold swaps and loans made, and central banks sold a lot of gold off the, after these last, you know, the last 10 years. A lot of the gold has left the West and is gone to the East. 
and the central banks that now have positive trade balances, they buy up the gold. There has to be a message in there and a significance, even for those who don't want to have restraints of gold, there has to be a message out there uh, that, that we should look at because we're in a financial mess and it has to do with our monetary system and it's being reflected today in rising prices and a weak economy and just printing all this money isn't doing any good. All this stuff that's been done for three years and you look at the economic statistics now, they're horrible. And, uh, and, and these people who lost their jobs, uh, they're still unemployed. The people who bought stocks in the year 2000, uh, if they held on, they probably haven't even broken even. They probably lost purchasing power. So eventually, I, I think, I know this is off the subject a little bit, but it is, is reflected only in that we don't know exactly what goes on. And people, when they don't know, then they get suspicious and they say, well, it's kept secret from us. Why aren't we allowed to know? And uh, we, we just march on. And the type of dollars we're talking about, and when we hear about this money going to central banks and uh, banks that Gaddafi was a part owner in, I mean, this stuff is, this, this uh, really stirs up the emotions of a lot of, a lot of people. But I do appreciate you being here. And, and I, I know that. Uh, There'll be a lot of questions. Uh, there will be written questions submitted, and uh, we'd appreciate your cooperation and, and send us our answers back. And I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>